Welcome back to Rafford Reading Daily. We are continuing to read Hinterland, America's New Landscape of Class and Conflict by Phil A. Neal. We are still on chapter one. This is a longer chapter. I think that we'll probably finish chapter one this episode. This next segment that we're about to read is entitled The Oath. But before we begin reading that, I would like to ask you to share the link to this episode on any social media platform, text message it to somebody, email it to somebody, anything you need to do. Just do the do me the favor of putting it out there in the universe and then we'll let the universe take care of the rest. Remember, we put these episodes out on SoundCloud, on Spotify, on Pocket Cast, on Anchor, on YouTube, Facebook, uh, anywhere that podcast, anywhere that audio is available, we have this podcast series available. And one of the things I've been trying to do is sort of do like a, a previously on Rockford Reading. So previously on Rockford Reading, we got introduced to the concept of the hinterlands. We got introduced to the concept of far hinterlands and near hinterlands. E, I'm trying to see if I can get to that definition quick enough. Okay. Can I get to it quick enough? Uh, okay. The far hinterland is more traditionally rural and the near hinterland by contrast encompasses the foothills descending from the summit of the mega city and is largely suburban. We haven't really heard about the near read about the near hinterlands yet, but we have been doing a nice amount of reading about the far hinterlands. We've read about some of the conflicts that are going on in hinterlands in the West coast of America. Uh, we read about some of the commonalities between hinterlands and capitalism and class conflicts in countries like China and in America and Midwestern cities like uh, Detroit. Uh, we read about the some of the far right and alt right and right wing groups that have arisen in these West Coast hinterlands and, and how they're struggling and combating against the government that uh, owns so much land over there which was another thing I thought was very enlightening, learning about how much land the federal government owns over there. We've learned some about the Bureau of Land Management, which was something that I had never read about or really knew anything about up until uh, opening up this book. We, hmm, we've also read about uh, some of the commonalities between, uh, well, one of the things that stands out, has stood out to me is, uh, struggles around rent and have been of our uh struggles around rent seem to be a linchpin of the agenda of some of these groups in these west coast hinterlands which draw some commonalities to the book that we just read evicted by matthew desmond even though it was much more of a urban setting that people were struggling with issues of rent we still see some of the we still see the, uh, the the commonalities, which I just said commonalities, but we see the commonalities between how certain struggles are being waged and existing in urban areas and how they are being waged and existing in rural areas. And we also see the differences. Uh, and so those are all things that have stood out to me so far. Okay, let's begin. <clears throat> the Oath. In Nevada, the real desert was not the dust or the sagebrush, but the massive industrial leveling that characterizes the day-to-day -day functioning of a, quote, healthy economy, end quote. The undead sagebrush at least held multitudes of life in its roots. Once, when one of my higher-ups had been out on a job, he'd run across a den of wild foxes. He spent several days watching them, counting their numbers, excited that the nearby mine hadn't driven away all the sparse desert fauna. But he made the mistake of telling his co-workers, and the next weekend, one of the other employees, a red-faced, blundering man originally from some exurb in Florida, drove his truck out to the area, tracked down the foxes, shot them all, skinned them, and took the pelts as trophies. It often seems as if there is an unbridgeable gap between the minds of those enmeshed in the present world and those who see it as almost unthinkably monstrous, something that is not even a, quote, world, end quote, but the name for an utterly autonomous status quo constructed on the continual ruin of worlds is such. There are those who see foxes and those who see pelts. 
the myth of the third position, the idea that people can and should take a political stance that goes, quote, beyond left and right, end quote, comes from the observation that both the far right and the far left see the present world as untenable. They make no distinction between the fact that the far right is almost always dependent upon a mythic past to illustrate its illusion of order, whether national, tribal, filial, or, some, or simply some variant of the strong winning out over the weak, because their supposed, quote, neither left nor right, end quote, politics is often founded on the same anthropological sleight of hand. For someone like Donovan, opposition to the present order is a call to, quote, start the world, end quote. What this looks like, however, is a rather traditional masculine eco-tribalism defined by the ability of men to become men again, the ability of white people to return to their, quote, indigenous, end quote, roots, and the ability of local self-reliance to foster meteor meritocracies in which the crippling effects of the present atonal order of status quo liberalism, poetically characterized as, quote, a sky without eagles, end quote is dissolved into local communitarian units defined by an organic hierarchy that ascends out of people's personal endowments, enhanced by training and discipline. One day, while hiking around a dried-out wash to get at a particularly inaccessible stretch of fence, I also came across a den of foxes. Startled, one of them had shot out from the dark trails of sagebrush to retreat across the floodbed, its paws scattering the rain, gathering stones. At some distances, it stopped and turned to look back at the threat from which it had fled. It met my eyes with its own. Two dark pools as slick as oil, glinting with that wild light you can only catch for an instant. Flashing across feral bodies like some force inside them writhing to get out, to spill into the world uncontained, and that struggle itself driving the body forward. A glimpse of wilds untamed through plundered. A glimpse of wilds untamed though plundered. And those eyes was a reminder that despite the mundane world breaking driven. Try it one more time. Sorry. In those eyes was a reminder that despite the mundane world breaking driven by price and profit, worlds could still be born, linked together, made to bloom. That even when the economy seemed to have reached an unprecedented expanse, it was driven by a crisis that forced its very core constantly to decay. Intercises opening within the cycles of accumulation and devastation. Wild, unpredictable potential stirred in the desert. Insurrection shuddered out of the economy's roots like so many feral animals. Time seemed to slow, strung between myself and those glimmering eyes, both of us frozen, each seeming to expect something of the other. Then the fox turned and shot around the bend. I never saw it again. I never spoke of its existence. Someone like Jack Donovan would also see the fox and not the pelt, maybe even seeing it as much as I did. We might see the same economic apocalypse, the same increase in the violence of riots and insurrections, the same strategic openings offered by these events, the same placid misery offered by the status quo. But none of this makes us allies. The myth of the third position is, pri is precisely that opposition to the present order and all gradualist attempts to change it is the only unifying force that matters, with left and right being more, with left and right being mere ideological accessories. But dig deeper and politics is inevitably replaced by nature, tradition, or some other seemingly apolitical order in which the sanctity of the community is preserved by its ability to wall itself off from all others. Third positionism, national anarchism, the patriot movement, and even the simple populism of Trump are all forms of blood politics. Political practice only exists for them insofar as it can be performed by kindred actors, and politics is the performance of this kinship. What is nonetheless fascinating about the new far right is its commitment to pragmatic action. The Oath Keepers and Three Percenters offer a fundamental theoretical insight here since their existence is dependent on the ability to unify across the fragmentation of the proletariat via the, quote, oath, end quote, as a shared principle of action. In contrast to the unwildly populism, excuse me, mispronounced that word. In contrast to the unwieldy populism of the, quote, 99%, end quote, 
the Patriot Movement proposes a focus on the functional abilities of an engaged minority, the 11%, the 3%, excuse me, which can gain popular support via its ability to outcompete the state and other opponents in an environment of economic collapse. And it is this fact that is missed in most, quote, anti-fascist, end quote, analysis. Rather than attempting to identify individual grouplets, parse their ideologies, and see how their practice accords, or doesn't, with whatever programs they put forward, per the usual leftist formula, it is far more useful to explore moments like ours as chaotic processes in which many different actors have to take sides in relation to political upheavals, the collapse of the economic order, and the various new forces that arise amid all this. Such grouplets are often ad hoc and frequently do not state any political positions. They seem empty of ideological content, or it is so vague as to be inconsequential. They are driven not by the program, but by the oath. The feature that distinguishes them is not so much their beliefs, as laid out in founding documents or key theoretical texts, but the way that they act relative to sequences of struggle and collapse. These are concrete things such as how they approach influxes of refugees and migrant workers, how they participate in or against local cycles of unrest, whom they ally themselves with in the midst of an insurrection, and whose interests they serve when they begin to succeed in the game of, quote, competitive control, end quote, creating local structures of power. The far right is defined by an oath of blood. They share the commitment to pragmatic action and the ability to see the untenable nature of the present economic order, but their actions are exclusionary and their strategy envisions closed, communitarian solutions to systemic collapse. This is most visible in the more experienced, thought-out form of the Patriot Movement or the Wolves of Vinland, but it exists on a continuum as more residents of the hinterland become aware of the apocalypse surrounding them. But the real political advance visible in the far right and the thing that has made possible its recent ascendance is the pragmatic focus on questions of power, which are religiously ignored by the American leftists, who instead focuses on building elaborate political programs and ornate utopias as if politics were the exercise of one's imagination. It is this focus on building power in the midst of crisis that distinguishes the partisan from the leftist. And the oath is the present organizational form of partisanship. And that brings us to a changing of the theme within this chapter. So here, let's have a reflection. One of the common themes that we have run across here in this first portion of this book is the author pointing out how these far right groups take advantage of missteps by liberal groups or by leftist groups. And I think that that's one of the things that I've noticed in urban areas very much. And so it's not surprising to hear that the same thing happens in rural areas is that uh, in Somebody told me before uh, that Democrats are more conservative or more right leaning than the people who are actually leftist or people who are uh, communist or anarchist or or socialist or any of some of these other things that they're closer to conservatives and closer to the Republicans when it comes to these things. And that's why they tend to roll out the same type of. Uh, people to be elected, these people who are closer to the Republican Party or closer to the uh, yeah, closer to the Republican Party and conservatives than they are to the people that they're claiming to be their base or the people that they want to be their base. And I think that uh, also one of the things that happens because of this lack of because of the the Demo Democrats and liberals. Not. Uh, because of some of their discrepancies, one of the other things that happens is that people become disillusioned who are progressive or who uh, are on the opposite side of conservative conservatism. And they don't believe in in the people who attach Democrat to their name or attach Democrat to their title. Uh, and I know that that's for me, you know, somebody telling me that they're a Democrat is something that causes me intrepidation automatically because I know that the, there, there's no party in this country, either presently or in past history, 
who is who has been pro black people who has been pro working class pro poor people who has been pro marginalized people and pro subjugated people uh who have been anti exploiting people and and so we are all the people who are on the bottom rung there is you know for capitalism to work there has to be a group of people who are being exploited and who are having uh their labor extracted for uh another group of people to make capital off of and if you're in that group or if you're not able to get employed and you're working on the fringes like uh, in the black market or selling drugs or something like that everybody all of these same groups of people categories of people are still uh are still on the margins and still being subjugated by the same upper echelons group of people uh and i hope i i sort of convoluted that a little bit some but my only point is that and so these some of these far right groups because race has been such a a historic marker in this country they can use the whether it's subliminally or subconsciously they can galvanize around race you know they talked about indigenous you know indigenous white people you know are going back to their roots or whatever like that's something that can be galvanized around, you know, this, this concept, when I hear blood oath, you know, I think, of course, when I, even when I hear tribalism, when I think tribalism to me, that goes back into a, a form of, of, of racism, a form of, uh, of colorism uh, that I think is attached to it specifically in, in America. And, and so to me, I think that that's some of the, one of the things that stands out very much is this vacuum of power that is left because the Democrats and liberals are closer in ideology to conservatives and the right wing than they are to uh, people that are leftists. And I don't know if I'm using some of these terminologies right, <clears throat> but that leaves a, a power vacuum there because because there's a whole set of disgruntled a whole there are communities of disgruntled people and this, these far right alt right groups can say, Hey, you're disgruntled because Democrats are trying to give all your money to poor black people, or you're disgruntled because Democrats are trying to give all your resources to uh, poor refugees or immigrants or people of color. And so then they can use that as a way to galvanize that base to combat the Democrats. And then also to combat the Republicans that they believe aren't combating the Democrats enough. Uh, and so I hope all of those things sort of hope that all makes sense. Partisans. In more abstract terms, we can roughly schematize present political allegiances according to how they understand partisanship and position themselves relative to global sequences of struggle and insurrection. First, these global cycles of struggle are themselves the return of what Marx called the, quote, historical party, end quote which is essentially the name for the generalization of some degree of social upheaval across international boundaries, the increase in the rate at which new struggles become visible and the intensity that they are able to reach. All struggles within the historical party tend toward what might be called, quote, demandlessness, end quote, for lack of a better word. This isn't to say that individual struggles don't have particular demands, but that they tend actually to overflow with demands in such a way that the only thing that coheres them is a generalized rejection of the present order. The idea that all the politicians must go, that there just needs to be some fundamental change no matter its character, that the present cannot be born any longer. This also often infers that they tend towards a generalized becoming riot, since no simple suite of reforms can be pushed through in all attempts to do so, via Syriza, Podemos, have ended in failure, no matter their level of electoral success. It is through this demandlessness, the recognition in action that the present system is fundamentally impossible, rather than mismanaged, that the specter of communism is resurrected. The, quote, invariant program, end quote, of communism, a term used by Amido Bordiga, the leader of the Italian Communist Party in its insurrectionary heyday, is inferred by people's generalized action against the present in which some sort of vaguely defined communalism is opposed to the material community of capital. But the specter only haunts the riot from its fringes, and the communal easily transforms into the communitarian. In contrast, the, quote, formal party, 
end quote, is the name of the emergence of organization from the motion of the historical party. Organization here means the confrontation and overcoming of material limits to a given struggle. Whether those involved in this process think of themselves as in and, quote, organization, end quote, is irrelevant. The reality is that such acts are unified more by the shared action implied by the oath rather than card-carrying membership. Speaking of the only proto-communist partisans, Bordiga calls this the, quote, ephemeral party, end quote since his form and existence are contingent on historical conditions. Marx, mocking the fear-mongering press of the day, calls it the, quote, party of anarchy, end quote. Whereas the historical party refers to content, the formal party refers, precisely, to pragmatic form, in this case the oath and the building of power, since it is positioned within a contingent array of historical conditions that require practical overcoming. Bordiga and Marx both saw the union of the formal and historical parties as the emergence of the Communist Party proper. But there are also various forms of non-union between formal and historical party in which individuals can play the role of anti-communist partisans, either in defense of the liberal status quo or as advocates of a reactionary alternative. In opposition to the, quote, party of anarchy, end quote, Marx portrayed the alliance of ruling interest as a, quote, party of order, end quote since their conception of political upheavals was one that could see such events only as chaotic aberrations. These are individuals for whom the world is nothing but pelts, the economy a vast machine that unites the interest of humanity with that of capital. To be slightly more concrete, they are those urbanites who woke up on the morning after the election and looked around themselves in shock, as if someone had tied ropes around their ankles and dragged them out into the rust-spattered American bloodlands while they slept. Their expressions utterly ashen. They frantically tapped their phones trying to order an Uber to take them back home. But the Uber would never come. They earnestly could not conceive of a world in which Hillary had not won. How could people be so utterly crazy, they asked themselves, before scouring Facebook for a litany of responsible parties, racist ruralities, third-party voters, those infinitely troublesome anarchists, or that vast majority party in American politics? the faithless zealots of the, quote, did not vote, end quote, ticket. The party of order is defined by its desire that the riot or insurrection be simply smoothed over. They want reforms to be implemented. They want us to let the slow gears of justice turn. They want body cameras on cops. They want community policing. They don't see enough black faces in the room. They just want everyone at the table. The party of order, therefore, opposes both the extreme left and the extreme right. For them. The problem is, quote, extremism, end quote, as such, and the maintenance of the placid, atonal status quo. They have no politics, only administration. Donovan's characterization of liberalism as a, quote, sky without eagles, end quote, is not an incorrect portrayal of their flattened world. The far right does, then, understand itself as opposed to the party of order and may even conceive itself, broadly speaking, as part of the party of anarchy since they also ride the tide of the historical party's upheavals, intervening in the same insurrections and wreaking destruction against the violent, mechanical order defended by global elites. But it is Donovan's solution to this atonality that hints at the true nature of the far-right position in an era of generalizing partisanship. His cure for atonality is an organically hierarchical Nietzschean tribalism, a return to some sort of primal indig indigeny indigenity, encapsulated in the demand to, quote, start the world, end quote. But what is the world he wants to start? The formal parties of the far right are unable to fuse with the historical party because, in essence, they see the potentials opened by it as doors through which they might return to some sort of wholesome, organic order, which is opposed to both the anarchy of insurrection and the corrupt, false order of the status quo. For them, Uprisings of the truly dispossessed are just as much symptoms of the system's decadence. Even while they draw from this anger, their politics is defined by its attempt to simply ignore the actual potentials offered by the historical party, to deny the specter of communism and execute its partisans. For them, these are only opportunities insofar as they are opportunities to hasten collapse. They thereby obscure politics as such, 
and thus it is natural that they claim to have moved, quote, beyond left and right, end quote. Their practice is one that occults the potential for a communist response to the crisis, and their ideology is therefore not marked by any sort of consistent political program, but by conspiracy and obfuscation. Obf- 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 right, I'm going to have to look that one up after we finish this up, uh, this passage. They don't see the historical party as foreboding a possible future at all, but instead is simply signaling the return of the worlds amid the collapse of the world-shattering rituals of capital. The political event is obscured, the hastening of collapse replaces revolution, and wall-building preparation replaces communization. The far right is therefore neither the party of anarchy nor the party of order, but the anti-party. The political practice of the anti-party is centered on the masculinized practice of violence in the name of a wholesome, salvific order to come. In material terms, the far right tends to cluster among the interests of the petty proprietors or self-employed, but still moderately wealthy workers of the hinterland. But the truth is that none of these phenomena have made country people inherently turn towards right-wing solutions and the far hinterland is as much an ideological as material base for the far right. There was not even resounding support for Trump across the mud-soaked trailer parks and windswept mountain hamlets of the American hinterland, where most people simply did not vote. The material core of the far right is instead the whitening exurb, the actual home of most patriots and third positionists, which acts as an interface between the metropolitan and non-metropolitan, allowing the wealthier landholders business owners, cops, soldiers, or self-employed contractors to recruit from adjacent zones of abject white poverty, essentially funneling money from their own employment in urban industry into hinterland political projects. Violence plays a central role here. Since many of these individuals are active in the suppression of the surplus population in the near hinterland, the exur bordering newly impoverished, diverse inner ring suburbs where immigrants settle in large numbers alongside those forced out of the urban core by skyrocketing rents. This reactionary politics is simply the idea that the regular violence used by the status quo in its maintenance of the present world of police, prisons, and poverty might also be widened, aimed at the urban core itself and the soft-handed liberals made to suffer. The world can be restored into the hands of the barbarians through salvific acts of violence capable of forcing the collapse and hastening the approach of the true community. It is in this way that the far right in the U.S., as elsewhere, is an essentially terroristic force and will almost always target the innocent, the weak, and the dispossessed in its exercise of power. Behind the call to, quote, start the world, end quote, lies a desire simply to watch it all collapse to force the world to burn and everyone to burn with it. And then that brings us to a changing of the theme within this chapter. We got a pa- we got like a page and a half left in this chapter. So we'll knock that out in this episode, but let's have a small reflection first. So I think it was some very enlightening terms that was used and some very enlightening classifications that were used in this last passage. I was just doing some highlighting after uh, after reading through it, one of the things I try to commonly do when I'm reading is highlighting, and I've sort of talked about this through different uh, episodes here, but I would encourage anybody else who reads to to highlight segments. It makes it, you know, when I want to go back over through a book, I, I can open up a book and I see the sections that's highlighted. Usually I might be looking for a specific uh, passage or quote and seeing highlighted portions of the book sort of helps me to get to those passages or quotes a little easier. But... <clears throat> This historical party and formal party, I thought that that was very, uh, a v- very in- interesting classifications. The description of the historical party, uh, the name for the generalization of some degree of social upheaval across international boundaries and the increase in the rate at which new struggles become visible and the intensity that they are able to reach. And that's what it makes me think about 2020 heavily. Uh, the well, the the first the the summer spring summer of 2020 heavily makes me think of historical party, and then this definition of formal party, the name for the emergence of organization from the motion of the historical party, uh, makes me sort of think of the fall of 2020 and how people were trying to galvanize some of that energy that had took place in the spring and the summer to uh, organize. <laughs> 
excuse me, organizing and uh, movement building to try to address the issues of police terrorism and mass incarceration, racial injustice that have manifested so heavily in the uprisings of 2020. And I think within that concept of formal party, you can see also that some of the concepts that we talked about of co-optization of the Democratic Party and liberals uh, also take place, that that formal party is uh, where the Democrats and the liberals try to come in and, and siphon that energy or siphon that motion that has been built. Uh, and then also this, the uh, they talked about struggles within the historical party tending to lean towards what people call demandlessness, uh, which is to say that struggles don't have particular demands, but that they tend to actually overflow with demands in such a way that the only thing that coheres them is a generalized rejection of the present order. The idea that all the politicians must go, that there just needs to be some fundamental change, no matter his character, that the present cannot be born any longer. And I think that that is very much a uh, a belief that I have, a belief system that I have. That and, and that was one of the things that the May 30th Alliance was challenged about a lot early on is that we didn't have specific demands or we didn't. We, we didn't know what we wanted or we didn't have anything that we wanted. And the truth of the matter is that we had put out so many, we had put out sets of demand lists because of so many different injustices that had happened. And then even within those demands that we had put out, there was an overall desire for a changing of the entirety of the culture, a changing of the entirety of the value system, a complete revolution of the, the city, the county that we are living in, and that anything less than that would not suffice. Uh, and I think that that has to be a staple of movement building in 2022 in the 21st century because of the drastic nature of the things that we are facing. Uh, so those are all things that, that stood out to me very much. And also the, the, the defining of the liberals and talking about liberals waking up after Hillary, Hillary Clinton had lost and trying to find who to blame and not believing that this could happen and wanting more black faces in a room and just wanting everybody at the table. Uh, I think that that has been very true to my experience with, with liberals here in uh, Rockford as well. Okay. Let's knock out this last page and a half and then we will be done with this chapter and we will be on to chapter two and we'll start chapter two on the next episode. Drawing the Eagle from the Flesh Stories changed hands in the trailer park like contraband. You were never sure of their source or their reliability, but everyone seemed to have an insatiable thirst for news of what was happening in other mines, along the pipelines, out on the ranches, and amid the intricacies of the Bureau land management bureaucracy. One story that stuck with me was about a miner in Galconda, that small town wedged between mines and farms, where workers would park their cars outside the bar in order to bust out to those on the work sites. No one knew what the guy was on, but everyone seemed to think it was more than whatever it seemed to be. Some weed laced with something, some new sort of meth brought up by the cartels, or it was angel dust, as if we were stuck in the fucking 1990s. Regardless of what he'd taken, the miner had gotten off his night shift and headed to that small bar in Galconda. The mines were worked, the mines were worked in two shifts, day and night, each split between above ground and underground work. You were paid the most for night work and for underground work, and that's what this miner did. He had some sort of condition, they said, a special sensitivity to light, like a vampire. He had to cover his skin in the desert sun or he'd start to burn, his flesh reddening and then bubbling up like the skin on an overcooked soup. So he worked nights and he worked underground, the farthest he could get from the light. This also meant that he made an enormous amount of money, ensuring that he could live comfortably for years after the boom had ended. It was because of this fact that everyone assumed he must have been tweaking. He must have been something in that haze of stimulants and just been broken by it. He must have seen something in that haze of stimulants and just been broken by it. Because otherwise, none of it made sense. He ran from the bar screaming incoherently, straight out into the midday light. Once outside, he ripped off his clothes as soon as the burning began, exposing the entirety of his nocturnal white body to that scorching, flesh-tearing avalanche of desert light, each ray reflected off the glass, seizing it to his pale skin like a meat hook. 
and he ran like that, naked, burning, smashing the windows of all the other miners' cars and throwing their belongings out into the sun with him. The sheriffs came, eventually, and tackled him into the dust, hardly able to get a grip on his shimmering, sun body. No one could understand whatever he was screaming. He just stared into the sun, yelling words that seemed to not be words, words occulted by the unspeakable sublimity of whatever salvation he'd seen through the drugs or through the simple misery of his lightless toil, all night, digging into the hallowed earth, melting dust into gold for unimaginably rich men whom he would never see. They say that when they put the handcuffs on him, his skin sloughed, sloughed off like that of a snake. Oh, Jesus Christ. Sorry, this is fucking descriptive. <clears throat> they say that when they put their handcuffs on him, his skin slough, sloughed off like that of a snake, revealing the blood-red pulse of pure life like an incar- incarnadine second body sitting beneath the first. That salvific absolute body to come, maybe. The tribe, the nation, the ever-approaching community, the maddened eagle rising from the flesh. And that is the end of chapter one, Oaths of Blood, and brings us to the beginning of chapter two, which is entitled Silver and Ash. And I think one of the last things that stands out to me is uh, that's one of the, we've had some glimpses of the of desperation. One of the commonalities of all the books that we've read has been the specter of desperation on people in their lives and how that has impacted them. And we've seen that uh, as well here in Hinterland. So please share this on, on whatever platform you're listening to it on or share this from whatever platform you're listening to it on. Remember, we put these episodes out on a daily basis to provide people the opportunity to begin or further their journey in the struggle against police terrorism, mass incarceration and racial injustice. And I'll holler at you tomorrow.